Welcome to Conversations with Z and Vindesh, a weekly discussion that explores common life challenges and offers practical solutions. Learn more at dharmamedia.com. That's D H A R M A media.com. All right, back here for another episode of Conversations. And today we're talking about why. Why is in, what are the reasons why we've seen all the craziness we've seen in the last two months where the world is literally turned upside down? More generally, why is in, why have we lost the temperament to ask questions? To just ask basic questions about the state of society, the, the state of the world, the reason that we've evolved in a certain way without being labeled as someone on the fringe, someone who's disruptive. So another way to think about this is where have all the questions gone? Why are no one, or why is no one asking questions? And see, when I think about what's happening now, there are so many questions that come to my mind that are unanswered. So we look at what's happened, and if we quickly recap, three months ago, things were fine. We had some virus in China. China was locking people down. The world was worried about disruptions in the supply chain. So maybe companies wouldn't be able to create as many products as they do. Maybe there would be a little bit slower growth. You'd see global growth go from 3.0% to 2.8%, some minor blip. And then we get the virus and the virus leaves China, goes to South Korea, to Iran, to Italy, from there to Spain, gets to the U.S., gets on a bunch of cruise ships. And then suddenly we got cases in the U.S. And now people are talking about, well, what are we going to do? Case numbers are increasing. And then we get to mid-March, and almost overnight, everything changes. We suddenly go into the state of lockdown. So it was like a cascade. We had events that were canceled. We had schools that were canceled. Suddenly everyone's on a work from home policy. Then you can't even work from home. Some people can, but other businesses have to shut down. You've only got businesses that serve critical needs that can stay open. Then that's not even good enough. Now you have to wear a mask in public. Now, if you're not wearing a mask, you might get beaten by the police. You might get fined. Take that another step. We're talking about a vaccine coming in 18 months. And when that vaccine comes, people in the policy realm are saying everyone's got to get vaccinated. Not only do you have to get vaccinated, you have to prove that you've been vaccinated. That's going to be part of your ID. Maybe it's part of the chip that's implanted in you. In the meantime, we've completely shut down the economy. People are out of work in record numbers. The unemployment is spiking faster than it did in the Great Depression. There's a cascade of effects. People can't pay their rent because they can't pay their rent. Landlords can't pay banks. Loans are going bad. Everything is shutting down. And there's no plan for this. So on the one hand, you've got this mantra coming out of the medical community, which is we've got to save lives. Okay, who are the lives that we're saving? What is the cost of that life that we're saving? What is the condition of these people? What is their life expectancy, the quality of their life? What is a reasonable expectation for how much energy we as a society can put in to saving someone from old age or poor life decisions? But no, it's just a mantra that we can't sacrifice lives at any cost. Well, guess what? We do all the time. That's what life is all about. It's about trade-offs. We can't accomplish everything. So if we're putting resources in one area, we're taking it away from somewhere else. Sure. Now, we've got the medical community who has gone on this crusade to say... We have to stop this virus in its tracks. We cannot resume normal functioning of our society until all the cases disappear. God knows what happens when we get past this and then they reappear. Do we shut down again? I don't know. It, vaccine is 18 months away. We can't shut down the world for 18 months. What are the long-term implications of this? How do we get people back into work? And I look at all of this and I just think, I cannot believe what has happened. I cannot believe the speed of the decline. I cannot believe the lack of thought. If we look at the data, yes, this does seem to be a serious condition. 
Stats say that it's 10 times more lethal than flu. We can debate that, but let's take the stats on the surface. 10 times more lethal, death rate of about 1%. There are people who are getting it. The ones who get it and are affected, it does seem to be pretty serious. They're in the hospital for a week, two weeks. Some are dying. They can't breathe. So worse than your average flu. Clearly something that you might want to protect yourself against. But in our frenzy to eradicate this threat, no one's asking questions about what is the size of the threat? How much risk are we willing to take? Why do we assume this threat has to go to zero when we take risks every single day of our lives? So we're willing to accept risk in interactions, uh, when we get in the car, when we step onto an elevator. Everything we do in life involves some risk. So why is this risk so unacceptable that we have to move it down to zero? And on the other side, the economic cost of this is tremendous. We're destroying society. We're setting ourselves back. I mean, I wouldn't even say we're setting ourselves back. It's almost like we've created infrastructure over 100 years, and that infrastructure is grinding to a halt. And the tracks that support this train that our society runs on, <clears throat> we're dismantling. Mm -hmm. So businesses are disappearing. They're not going to come back. Banks are in bad shape. In the meantime, the only response to this is to throw money at the problem. Again, there's no sense of how much money this is going to be. Is it going to be $2 trillion? Is it going to be $5 trillion? Is it going to be $10 trillion? We don't know. Where's that money going to come from? We don't know. Are people going to be able to create their own businesses and function normally? Because even when we do get out of this, there's still going to be social distancing measures in place. How restrictive are those going to be? Can we go about commerce the way that we have in the past? Unclear. Are people going to be able to earn a living the way that they have in the past? Unclear. Are you still going to have a job? If you have talent, if you have vision, and you want to start a business, are you going to be able to get a loan? Are you going to be able to serve your customers? Or are, is someone going to say, sorry, no one's allowed in your business. No one's allowed within six feet of you. You just can't transact. So the wheels are coming off of the train and we're just going along with this. And the politicians are repeating the same mantra over and over again. We have to be safe. We can't save lives. When I look at this, the degree of threat is totally out of proportion to the response. The response is as if the mortality rate were 50%, as if this were an existential threat. If it were going to wipe out civilization, I get it, man. I mean, hunker down. Let's wait until the storm passes. Then right. we'll come out. We'll rebuild. But even if we do nothing and 1% of people die and that 1% is skewed towards the unhealthy and the old, yeah, it's sad. But why does it require that we destroy everything that we built up over generations? And what is the plan for coming out of this on the other side? There's no plan. So when I think about this, a couple of things shock me. Number one, no one is asking these questions. There are a few people who are asking these questions, but they're not getting airtime. The only thing that's getting airtime is discussions about how serious this is, anecdotes instead of data, mm -hmm. anecdotes about how some 27-year-old woman with no pre-existing conditions came in, diagnosed with COVID. She died a week later. It was horrific. Okay, that's one out of how many people? I don't know. But that's the narrative that's ripping through the media. So now we're in this state of terror. Oh, my God, I might get this. And the impact of that is that society is rife with fear. We're afraid of doing anything. In that state of panic, we're going along with these crazy proposals. Hospitals, we built out all this capacity expecting that we're going to get the surge of patients. Yes, there have been patients. It's been well below what the models have predicted. Those models have incorporated social distancing. The actual numbers are below what the projections were. There's, there are these tent hospitals which are waiting for patients which have never arrived. Ventilators, which we thought we would be in short supply of, we're finding out they're not even that effective because so many people are dying on the vents. Mm -hmm. And it's actually better to get them to move and to breathe and to get off their back to sure. resuscitate themselves. So a lot of the original concerns that we had, it seems like we're so far below that worst case. We would have survived the worst case. We're far below that worst case. But the level of panic increases. And the level of infringement 
upon our daily activities, our privacy, our liberty, that keeps on rationing up. So when I think about this, I can't understand it. And it just seems very odd to me that we're not asking these questions. It seems odd to me that this is happening. And normally I'm not a type who believes in conspiracy theories and that there's just some small group of people that's manipulating the world. I think the world is a very complex place. But I've got to say, man, I, I don't have answers. Right. And it almost seems like some wacky social experiment to see how long people will put up with these horrific conditions. Can we destroy productive capacity across the world? Can we convert nations into welfare states? Can we make people completely dependent on the state because they have no ability to maintain a job on their own? They have no ability to be entrepreneurs, to create their own businesses, to take charge of their own destinies. So everyone is subjugated to a massive government and we become slaves. I mean, is that the outcome? And then in addition to that, our movements are going to be tracked uh, because we need to make sure that we're not in contact with other people who have the virus. Mm. And privacy disappears. And what kind of world are we heading to? It, and all this is happening without thought. So when I look at this, I just wonder what is really causing this. Is it just random? And we become so primed to responding to fear and anxiety that this is a natural outcome of that. And all of the social media, all of the bias, the fear, it takes on a life of its own and people exploit it for their own gain uh, because crises are very good for leaders. Mm -hmm. They can create a crisis and then they can say, okay, now I'm going to save you from that crisis. And, and that's great. So is it just something that has happened organically? Or is there something else going behind this? I mean, is this someone's crazy experiment to see whether they can change the nature of civilization? So these are just the thoughts that have been going through my mind. I'm trying to make sense of this. I'm trying to understand why this is happening. I'm trying to understand why there aren't more questions. The other thing that I'll bring up, I mean, you look outside the U.S., and situations are more severe. In Spain, people can't leave their apartments. You get fined. In India, they're getting shot. Yeah, yeah, India is worse. There's been a complete lockdown. People are running out of food in some areas, even over here in the U.S., Food banks are running out of food. There's food hoarding in other parts of the world. And we're just saying, it's fine. We never need to see daylight again. We never need to work again. We're just going to rely on the government, but it's okay because we feel safe. I mean, is that what we've come to? That we're just so afraid of everything that we're willing to go along with this crazy experiment because we're just in such, in the grip of uh, th th this terror? I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on all of this? Well, well, Vin, just listening to you and I started, there were so many points that you were making. I started thinking that, thank God I'm an outlier. You know, that I'm not that attached to social structures as many people are, but I know there are many people that you know, are religious or they're really into the idea of government or patriotism or nationalism or they're, 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 they're into um, the order of society. But the picture that you were, you put out there is right out of a horror movie. And we, before we went on, I, I was really careful about not really talking about conspiracy theories. But I can't not think about it now after what you said because I start listening to the cognitive elite, the very powerful, and how gung ho they are about, you know, mass vaccinations with authoritarian oversight, right, to save you from something. So I think one of the tech guys was saying that, yeah. Not only do you get these vaccinations we're going to sponsor, but we're going to, in order for you to travel freely, you're going to have to have a digital record that you got this thing to save others, to save us from this impending doom. So you're not going to be able to make a choice if you want to have to travel unrestricted. And no one asks questions, and it's slowly, slowly, 
we're going along with things we never thought we would go along with. I can't help but see we've been headed that way for a long time. So if I was a basic social engineer, or if I was a basic uh, student of human society and I wanted to sit back in, in a small laboratory and do different models of how to control a species or direct society, then we're falling right in line with that and no one is asking little questions. But we've been headed that way for a long time. We have terms for people who ask questions that are always derogatory and negative. They call them conspiracy theorists, um, anti-vaxxers, right? People who question what's being injected into their children, just to question it. You're looked at it a certain way. Um, people who ask questions about the food supply. Is this GMO or non-GMO? You're considered kind of some kind of weirdo. You're socially marginalized. You're the butt of a joke. Not because you've done anything. You simply asked a question. So we've been marching this way for the last few decades. Uh, as we shared earlier, I thought about the Iraq War, the lead up to the Iraq War. And anyone who asked questions was considered unpatriotic and attacked threatened, possibly jailed or killed for saying, can we get more information on who is going to be attacked in response and in retribution for the 9-11 event? Anyone who simply asked for information was considered unpatriotic by all sides of the political spectrum, even a radio station like NPR, National Public Radio, which was considered left-wing, radical, and liberal, became National Pentagon Radio. Remember that? And then, sure enough, a few years later, it comes out that, well, Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. It was actually an ally. We have papers, documents. We even listed the few people that asked questions going down Historically, we've archived it. And these people were driven into insanity or either mysteriously disappeared. So again, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I'm just saying ask questions. Then we go back even further. They come out with a documentary about the Vietnam War called the Vietnam War. 50 years after the Vietnam War, freedom of Freedom of Information Act allows us to listen to presidential tapes and you hear J. Edgar Hoover is tapping everybody's phone. Everybody who was anybody tapped their phones and he has a conversation between the soon to be President Nixon discussing with the president of Vietnam, mind you Nixon is a civilian discussing with the president of Vietnam and encouraging him to continue the war so that he could be elected president and he would then give favors to this Vietnamese president if he extended the war against the wishes of the existing administration so he could win election. So all the words and the anti-Jane Fonda and all this other stuff that went on, there's something to it. There was no reason to have the Vietnam War. Then the other leaders of the war, the military heads, McNamara and everybody else, who, by the way, were very conservative, very extreme nationalist patriots, right-wingers, they said there was no reason to be there. There was no Gulf of Tonkin incident. So you look at the Vietnam Wall and all the lost lives and the, the, the tens of thousands of dead in this country and the possibly millions of dead in another country. There was no justifiable reason for that level of loss of life. And only a handful of people gained from it. But very few people 
asked questions. And those that asked questions were marginalized and given labels of being dissenters, radicals. They had all sorts of unfavorable words. They didn't do anything. They didn't blow up bridges or banks. They didn't kidnap anybody. Their major crime, their major misstep, their fatal flaw was to simply ask, what's going on? That was it. Now here we are during the Kofifi event. And Carlos came in here and told me that, hey, you know, people are partying in the streets. We're under the lockdown and the mask rule. Well, if you don't wear a mask, you may be beat, shot, or jailed by the police. And anyone who has a weapon or authority can beat you and jail you, take away your liberty and freedom if you don't wear a mask. They will jump on you, crack your head, make you vomit, and spray bodily fluids all over to enforce the mask rule, right? This is actually happening. I'm not making it up. It's actually happening. Neighbor against neighbor. If you hate people, it amplifies the hate. So if you don't like Chinese, you can beat a Chinese. And then the Chinese can then join up with the people beating them and beat an African. And anybody can then mob onto that and then crush a Sikh's head with a brick for not wearing a mask. It's actually happening. So whatever we felt about people, whatever our fears, our prejudices, our dislikes, we can release that now under the umbrella of protecting people from Kofifi. Okay? And no one asked questions. Carlos said people party in the streets because they got a check signed by the president with his autograph on it. They got the check, the freeways are packed, all kind of traffic on the street, they violated the mask and social distancing. They're partying like it's 1999, they got the check. And only a few years ago, we also thought that was the actions of a welfare queen. First and the 15th, the ghettos would light up. First and 15th, the welfare checks would come. Which, by the way, is socialism. It's the worst thing in the world to give people checks for nothing. Make them work for the checks. Make them drug test for the checks. Well, now everybody's getting the check. And they're partying through the apocalypse. Streets are crowded, pollution is coming back. Road rage, they have a few incidents of road rage. Things are getting back to normal. Things are looking brighter because we got the government check for the Kofifi. But don't ask any questions. They're making up a vaccine and they're gonna go test it in Chad in Africa where there's been one case of COVID brought in by a Frenchman. So they're gonna test the vaccine on some of my folks, see if it works or if it's okay. If they don't drop dead, then everybody can have it. But of course, there's a little rule, a little fine print. You need to give up all your personal information and give them access to your medical records to get the vaccine. Now you can not get the vaccine, but you won't be able to get a driver's license. Your credit will go through the floor. You can get the vaccine, but you must allow digital tracking of your movement. Because if you don't, we want to make sure that vaccine people are moving in crowds of other vaccinated people. And non-vaccinated people are watched. So you can only watch non-vaccinated people if you're watching the vaccinated people. I'm not calling it a conspiracy. I won't say that because the minute you say conspiracy, whatever you say 
is the rantings of a lunatic. I would just say simply ask questions. Not even for anybody else, but for yourself. What happens when there's Kofifi 20? Are we ready for that? And when all this money is spent and gone out, will the jobs come back? Will we no longer have to stand six foot away from people that look dirty? Whoever they are, whoever the dirty looking people are, whoever the diseased looking people are. Are the diseased people a different group of people than the people you already avoided? Are they dirtier? Will they have a different type of haircut or accents? So are the accent people less dirty? Is there a Kofifi warning model? Because Kofifi 20 will come. Similarly, because it's, it's numbered. So I'm just following the numbers. Well, I'm just asking questions. Of course they'll come. Viruses always come. Yeah. There's always some new virus. We happen to select this one and make it into a very big deal. And if that supports some purpose, we can do that again. We can always identify any random virus and say, oh my God, this is a threat. This is a potential pandemic. It might wipe out Uncle Louie, who's 103, who's been smoking for 40 years and is in a nursing home. Can't lose him. So everyone, you, so you got to stand your own. who can we lose? Who is expendable? Everyone Can we else? ask that question? Yeah, apparently everyone else is. Should apparently call? everyone else who's trying to pay the rent, mm -hmm. who's trying to make their own living, who's trying to support their family, maybe people who want to go outside, enjoy the fresh air, who don't want to go insane from living under lockdown, all of that's expendable. Okay, okay. So we need, maybe we need to ask that question. Who's less worthy of life whose life is less valuable than yours? Whose child, whose grandparent, maybe even deserves to die so we can get on with this? What is herd immunity? Which herd? Can we ask the question? Well, I think that's the biggest problem. I mean, that brings us back to the beginning of the conversation. If you look at what's happened, there are there is panic, which is part media, part social media, and that panic enables extreme policy. And then there's narrative. And the narratives are extremely reductive, but the narratives are something that, for whatever reason, we don't question. So these, the narrative that we have to save lives. Why? Why do we have to save lives? Whose lives do we have to save? But we're not able to ask that question, or at least people feel uncomfortable asking that question. I, I don't know. I mean, to me, are it's, we it's really... Are uncomfortable asking that question or are we com uncomfortable hearing what the answer will be from each of us? If you see what the Kofifi has done, first we decide who's dirty and who's clean based on our unbiased objective, you know, an, an objective view of society. Then I, 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 I thought about a question with Caitlin and... Did you get a check too? Mm -hmm. Carlos and Caitlin got checks. Now, you know, if more people die, will your check be that bigger by percentage? I'm wondering. So if let's say 20% die, will the check be 20% bigger? No, the checks are the same. The checks are the same no matter how many people die? Yeah. Hmm. Just wonder. I'm just asking a question. I'm not sure. I'm just wondering. Hmm. So why won't the check be bigger since there's more money available? Well, because the government, in its infinite wisdom, has calculated exactly how much each person needs to survive okay, okay. this undefined threat That's good. of so undetermined duration. A particular algebra of, of worth of citizenry. Okay, just wanted to know. I'm just curious, and I hope that that doesn't cause a problem if other people ask questions. Yeah. Because I didn't know. Yeah. Because I thought if I was Carlos. 
and Caitlin, and I get a certain amount of a check based on death rate and the population, and there's a certain amount of money available to split up. It's like we're on a raft together and there's only 10 cans of tuna fish and there's 10 people, right? Let's say five people fall overboard. That means there's more tuna fish for me. That, I mean, that's one math, right? But you say there's a different math on that. And I'm just wondering about it. I'm just thinking. Just wondering. Because then if that's the case, if there's more cans of tuna fish, then I might help you throw some people overboard. <laughs> Excuse me. Hmm. Right, Carlos? Carlos is like, he's getting ideas. He said, I could use a bigger check. <laughs> Everybody could use a bigger check, right, Caitlin? Everybody could use a bigger check. So if we had fewer people, so maybe we could adjust that algebra and get more of those signed checks from fearless leader. Just wonder. Yeah, I think there's a lot to wonder about. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. You lead us down paths sometimes. That, that, I don't know how to. You get started back. this, Vin. Don't blame me. You started this. <laughs> I didn't whole thing. Talk. You drew this horror movie out, and I'm just trying to fill in the script. Yeah, I didn't talk about Carlos going and offing fat people so he can take their checks. I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't say that. He, Carlos, said pre-existing conditions. Yeah, that is true. Carlos is very <laughs> diplomatic. Yeah. So let's talk about how this happens, because there are a few things that are at play that I think are interesting. We've talked about the fear, and the fear grips everyone, and I've seen this in my family. There are people in my family who are very afraid, and because they're afraid, they're happy to go along, and these are people you know. These are intelligent people. They're educated. They're thoughtful, mm -hmm. but the fear makes them think, you know what, whatever the policy is, so be it. I just want to be safe. I don't want to get this disease. And there's not really thought two or three or four steps ahead in terms of what the hell happens to our life. Are we actually going to have a life that resembles what we had? Or are we destroying our society to such an extent that we can never come back? So the fear is one aspect of this. The fear snowballs. So I think as soon as the fear is in place, people in positions of power love that because they can come out and they can reassure everyone and they can say, oh, we're doing this, this and that, and I can be your friend and you can trust me. There are articles, of, I forget if it was Garcetti or, or it might have been News. No, I think it was Garcetti, about how now he's this uncle figure or older brother and he's doling out advice. Who's Garcetti? Uh, Eric Garcetti. Oh, was that a musician? <laughs> Jerry Garcia? Uh, no. No, Eric Garcetti. I thought he the died. Guy. Wasn't he with the Grateful Dead? Yeah, yeah, a different guy. Who is Garcetti? He's the mayor of L.A. Oh. Okay, go on. No. All right, anyway. Um, yeah, no, I lost my train of thought again. Yeah, I thought he was the O.J. defender or, or, or prosecutor or something. Shows well, you, you how much I shows you yeah. how much they affect my life. Yeah, well, you had a bunch of people on that O.J. team. That's a separate story. Okay, so or you take the people in New York. Right. Uh, the, the Cuomos. Okay. You know the Cuomos? Sure, sure. Yeah, so the Cuomo brothers are turning into this uh, reality show, and uh, people identify with them, and it's almost some soap opera that we can watch playing out. So the politicians like this, their approval rating goes up. It gives them something to do. So they seize upon this, and that, mm -hmm. I think, helps things spiral out of control. Because suddenly everything becomes a crisis. If it was a crisis, whatever crisis it was, they take it, they make it that much worse, and then suddenly they can come to the rescue and boost their approval ratings. Mm -hmm. So that's another part of the equation. Then a third part of it is the lack of questioning, as we've talked about. Maybe it's not the lack of questioning, maybe it's the framing of these issues. So we talked about one aspect of this, this narrative that we have to save lives which I think is totally false. In everyday life, we're always making trade-offs. So we can look at any example of how we've lived throughout history. Mm -hmm. We're always making decisions about who to save, who not to save. So that's false. But we've adopted this narrative of we must save lives. There's this other narrative of, oh yeah, well the problem with the coronavirus is it's not just you, 
what you do is going to affect other people. That's why you have to be careful. That's why you have to stay at home because you can affect other people. Well, so what? We affect other people all the time. You smoke, you affect other people. You get on the road, you affect other people. You don't sleep well at night, you're in a bad mood, you affect other people. We don't regulate all of that. But somehow we reduce the discussion of these narratives that almost become axioms that no one questions. And that creates the force to move us along this path. I had a thought when you were saying that, Ben, as you paint this really scary, dystopian, apocalyptic view of our new world is what will you do to sedate your fear? What contract will you sign? And when you sign that contract, is it like a lease? Is it a short-term or long-term lease? Are there provisions of expiration on the contract you will make to sedate your fear? Will there be? Well, I think this is a mental game that we play. It's similar to what we've talked about before. People want to reassure themselves. You as an individual are afraid that you're going to get this thing. Mm -hmm. So number one, you decide to trust You decide to trust the government, the policymakers, and say, I'm going to put my faith in them. Suddenly, I don't have to worry about this. I'm not responsible for myself anymore. Mm -hmm. Someone else is going to come. The cavalry is going to swoop in and bail me out. And Do people really, I, I want to frame me, <clears throat> give me a picture, give me, put it in a frame. I, I want to see what that personality or temperament looks like because I'm not, you know, I'm an outlier. Right? Well, I think the temperament is every day, check the paper, check the guidelines. Okay, today we have to practice social distancing, so let's do that. A week goes by. Now we have to wear masks. Okay, I'm tuned in to the live feed. Uh, from the state of California. I've got all of the latest directives. Let me put on the mask. Okay, now, another couple of days pass. We can still go out. We can still go to stores, but really try to minimize the amount of time in a store. Really try to avoid all non-critical interactions. What, what won't you go along with? As the fear person, and, the, and, and, and you're listening to, again, the faceless committee, the, the overlord that... that you admire. I, I I don't know how to describe it. Hmm. The 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 godlike figure, the demagogue, or whoever you're listening to, the Wizard of Oz. What won't you go along with at, when you're fearful like this? I think you go along with anything. I think this is how we get into these completely insane outcomes. I mean, especially if you're going along with it and everyone else you know is going along with it and people are verbally assaulting you and questioning your integrity, questioning your morality, saying, how can you not take this seriously? Don't you know what's happening in the world? It just becomes easier. Maybe it's a question of picking your battles. It's easier to go along with it than not go along with it. Maybe it's a sense of comfort in numbers. When you say, even then, you, you, when you use something which is, which I agree with, you definitely pick your battles But you can't pick no battle. Can we pick no battle? Will you just go along with everything? What do you think, Carlos? No. I don't think you can. I think... Can we just go along with everything that comes out of who? What? Who decides? Is it one person? Like Ben, you said conspiracy. Is it a group? Is it a cabal? Is it just random people coming up with another sanction, restriction... I don't know. I'm, I'm just trying to hear it out because I'm an outlier. So. I don't think it matters who it comes from. I, I think the point is the same. My point about whether this is a conspiracy theory or not, I'm just trying to understand why it's happening. But in a sense, the implication is the same. It doesn't matter if it's a conspiracy theory, mm -hmm. if it's just fear, propagating fear. The implication is identical. We need to think for ourselves. We should question this. We should stop a train wreck before it happens. So where it comes from, in a sense, doesn't really matter. It's uh, to me, what do you do with what's happening? How do you live your own life? How do you have conversations with other people? 
around this to get to a more sensible place. Or if you were a trend modeler, you know, modeling trends, <coughs> looking at trends like, I don't know, I don't know if they do that in the financial world, but you look at trends and what they used to have, what, pork ears or whatever they used to look at, and they could kind of plot from season to season behavioral trends. You look at different algorithms and so forth, and, and what would be the trend as we go along with everything? Where would that lead us? So we used to never imagine a day where people would put a barcode or tattoo a barcode or, or chip themselves. That's not outrageous anymore. It's really not. That the tats that people wear, everybody got tats now, to get the barcoded chip tat. We're ready for that, aren't we? Yeah. What would you be willing to do to be able to go back and forth to Las Vegas legally? legally well I think a lot of people would do whatever they were asked to do what about the risk to your children of vaccines that were rushed through the pipeline who were pushed really hard uh, around the normal testing protocols would you See, I, I think this is where your perspective is different from most people's perspective. You said it yourself, you're an outlier. You don't, you've never really trusted the system. So this entire infrastructure that we have in place, you've talked about how you didn't think it was sustainable, so you've been prepared. Not that you were expecting an impending collapse, but it just seemed like one day things might shut down. And so you've got your Unimog, you've got your water filters, you've got other stuff that we won't <laughs> talk about. And they can get you through whatever happens. I don't think that that is how the vast majority of people operate. I think it's more that you are a part of a society, part of a system. That's all you've ever known. And you just trust that shit works. I mean, you think about our mentality, entitlement. We've talked about entitlement. What is entitlement besides a sense that things should just happen? I don't know how my fucking cell phone works, but God damn it, if I pick it up, and it drops a call, I'm pissed off. That fucking thing should work. I go to Starbucks, and they're out of my favorite decaf mochaccino. What the hell? They've really let me down. That's entitlement. Mm -hmm. That's a sense that all the comforts that we enjoy, we expect are going to continue in perpetuity without understanding what the cost is, without understanding how the sausage, sausage is made, What's the underlying machinery? What are we doing to each other? What are we doing to the environment? What about all the rage that's brewing because of this economic inequality that's been going on for decades? What about the polarization of the country? No, not our concern. We just want to get what we want. We want to get our Netflix on demand. We want to be able to go and buy the latest Tesla that comes out and not have to put our names on a waiting list. I think a lot of it is wrapped up in that sense of entitlement, this expectation that shit is going to work because it's worked in the past without any sense of the underlying machinery. And without that, it's a bit of a blind faith, but it's a blind faith that is built over a lifetime. And I think what it enables is what we're seeing right now, where you can push this to the limit because that faith is so strong. So you can push people in crazy directions and there's still a sense that we're going to be okay. We can trust the authorities because this stuff just works. Can I just ask everybody in the room, I'm just thinking about this and, and I'll, I'll share a, a little story. The other night, um, you know, I was talking uh, to my wife. And I look at trends. I tend to look at causality. So a few years ago, there was a farm bill and everybody was, the farmers were given a large amount of money to grow soybeans and corn so they could um, manipulate the Chinese, right, um, the food supply of China. And I thought about then, I said, well, most people don't eat soybean and corn as, as a mainstay in their diet. Well, the Chinese use a lot of soybean and corn as a base for a lot of food products. I personally don't do that. 
So I started thinking about it. I reflected upon the farm bill. And I said, wow, if this thing goes on for another month or so, there's going to be shortages of food in this country because not a lot of farmers grew diverse calories, produce. And not only that, there's been a big push, an anti-immigrant, anti-immigrant worker push in this country. So a lot of, a lot fewer uh, people from Mexico were coming here and working in agriculture. I think it dropped 50% or something because of the immigration policy. So you only have half or less than half of the people that pick the food. So a lot of that food is not going to be picked, but it's going to grow up. It's not going to be picked. It's not going to be stored. It's not going to be turned into frozen and canned goods. And sure enough, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal that looks like there's food shortages. Just the mention of food shortages will make people very anxious. And so I told my wife, let's have enough food on hand for two months, dried goods and frozen foods. And she said, yeah, I think that might be a good idea. And so we went out and got in the very next day, there was announcements that there were food shortages. So I told everybody I know quietly Every day, every other day, go to the stores where now they're rationing foods and get frozen and dry goods, whether you're means or not, so that you will have enough on hand when there is scarcity to get through this until things are sorted out. So I had some organic spinach on hand and I was washing the spinach and my son my five-year-old saw all the dirt in the spinach. So much, the spinach is very dirty. He says, wow, that's really dirty, Dad. That's really dirty, Baba. Shouldn't we wash all the food? I said, you should always wash your food, clean it out. And that's part of growing, because we're growing food out front. And this five-year-old understood the food chain. He understood the food chain and the, also the necessity of the effort it takes to grow, to clean the food, and then prepared for the plate. And as I'm listening to you, I'm wondering what, if any, is a limit that people have to compromising themselves so that they can keep going the way they're going. Is there any thing you wouldn't go along with? Microchipping, tattooing, food rationing lines. Is there anything that would cause people to say, hey, something isn't right? Would they, what would it take? And, and I'm going to ask you, what would it take for people to say, okay, this thing was built on sand, as you say, foundation sand, and it's falling apart, and I need to get the hell out of here. What would it be, Carlos? What would it be, Caitlin, any of you guys, Vin? What would it be with the people you know that they would go say, okay, this thing is falling apart? What would it take? Or is there anything, or would they just go down with the Titanic? I, I, think I don't know. I think it's a consensus across the board. If you disrupt just the basic norm, the basic That's been disrupted though. Life. No, but I mean like no TV. You, I mean, there's nothing on TV. You literally can't work and you can't even go to the store. But hold that for a moment. You can't work. There is nothing on TV except an endless loop of Kofifi news. I mean, there's a small percentage of those that are working still. There's a small percentage of those that those that have the means are still but, but, but again, Carlos, you're almost answering my question. What is about, how many people do you know that are out of work right now? Quite a bit. You, personally, what percentage of people do you know that are out of work, not working and just waiting? A good 25% of people. Is it just 25%? That I personally know yeah. that are in my circle, mm -hmm. yes. How that many I kids do more. you know that aren't going to school anymore? All. So 100% of the school-aged children you know are not going to school. Are not. What percentage of their parents are out of work that are home taking care of those kids that aren't going to school? Almost all. Almost one hundred percent. You see what I'm asking you? You see. You see where I'm taking you? Yeah. So you yourself didn't even see 
how weird it is until we are sitting here now and going down the list. So more than 25% of the people you know are out of work. Yeah. So what will it take for people to make an adjustment and not wait in that line and then go along? What is it that we won't go along with? When will we say, I'm on my own? We're all on our own. And that's what about you, Caitlin? Um, I, I would say that when we get to food shortages is when we'll really see people freaking out. and They will freak out, but I'm not talking about freaking out, because people are freaking out because yeah. you're going along with bizarre shit. Right. When will people change, adapt, accept, or will they ever... Or, I don't know, Vin. You, you get what I'm saying? Because Vin painted a real bleak picture. Now, I'm actually just standing back and and taking it apart and looking at the, the mechanism of it. As I just did an experiment with Carlos. That was an experiment. How many people do you know their lives are disrupted, they're out of work? First, he said 25%. 100% of children in school and 100% of parents are home taken care of. That's more than 25% of people you know. I think when people lose all of the luxuries that they're used to, you can't pay for Netflix anymore, you can't get your ice cream, your coffee and pastry. Um, is, is And the government will subsidize Netflix and that, because I get a note from Netflix, the price went down on Netflix for some reason. So they're subsidizing Netflix. Yeah. Does anybody think that's kind of I, I weird? I don't think there's any My Netflix necessary bill limit. was lower. Yeah, yeah, it is kind of weird. Who knows? Maybe you're just stuck in some old subscription plan. No. But Vin, come on. Let's just think about it. As long as, like, Caitlin just gave us a hint. As long as there's Netflix playing. Carlos said when there's nothing on TV, but in reality, there is nothing on TV. Are they making new movies right now? No. No, they're not. But all the movies that they did have, they're rushing them straight to Netflix. So there's movie. nothing on TV. There's nothing on TV. There's nothing on TV other than an endless loop of old movies. Is that right? Yeah. There is no news. We're already there. We're already there. But you assume there's a breaking point. I don't think there's a breaking point. I, I'm not I assuming. Think... I'm just asking. I'm just asking questions because this whole thing is about mm -hmm. why. That's all. Yeah, again, I don't know if there's a breaking point. I don't know if this is a social experiment to determine <laughs> how far you can push a population. And maybe this disappears and someone says, okay, great. <laughs> Let's, next time we can take it even further. We can completely break the human spirit. Maybe that's an outcome. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> but I think that most people just do what everyone else does and they fall in line and that's what's considered normal. Now, you do have some people who stand up and say, I'm not taking it anymore. And depending on the numbers... And the strength of that message and the strength of their spirit, they can shift direction. But it, I don't think it's from the center. I think it's from the fringes. And that has a certain gravity and momentum that might reshape direction. Uh, but otherwise, if you take the majority, the majority just look around and say, okay, this is what we're doing. This is what John is doing. Uh, this is what... My neighbor is doing, uh, my friend. to you, Vin, maybe we've already crossed that line. Maybe we're already, the spirit is already broken. I don't know. Hmm. Well, what is, is this qualitatively? What do you think, Kayla, listening to Vin, based on what he's saying, maybe we're reflecting back. It's already broken. Because there is no breaking point anymore. But how how different is this from what we've seen in history? I think the speed is very different. <laughs> I think the, the the speed and the magnitude are different, but the principles I don't know if they're that different. We've got through crazy times in history where people go along with crazy shit because everyone else is doing it, and what changes that? Either it's unsustainable, it collapses under its own weight. I mean, look, look at China. China's a regime which locks people down. They're moving millions of people to concentration camps. This was before COVID. The Muslim minorities that they don't want to deal with, they take them to education centers. 
and beat out whatever misconstrued views they have of life and religion. Have they done that here? You just said something interesting. Mm -hmm. Misconstrued views of life. What is our view of life here? Because I just asked Carlos. Mm -hmm. Very wonderful person here. Smart guy, brilliant guy. And it took him a minute. It took him a second, right, to realize it's more than 25%. So our view of life. You talked about China hurting millions of people. Are how many millions here being hurted? Hmm. Yeah, but I'm saying, I, I'm saying this was even before right, uh, right. COVID, and it's been sure. going on for decades. So what I'm saying is you've got examples of that happening around the world. And we've you got examples that of that. Example. Right here, we've learned, they've, the kind of elite have learned from that example, so you don't have to do it with army tanks. Yeah, so I think we're saying the same thing. I think that tendency has always been there. Mm -hmm. Maybe the fact that we're more primally oriented than we used to be, we're more susceptible to fear. Mm -hmm. There's just a much mm -hmm. faster dissemination of information. There's a better ability to manipulate. There's a complete breakdown of leadership. Maybe all of these things have amplified our worst tendencies and have put us in a situation where, yeah, we're going down this path farther and faster than anything we've ever seen. Wow. Um, we always do these podcasts, and, and, and my theme has always been to mitigate human suffering. And the direction I want to take now, um, what I'm thinking here is we're talking about it, I'm listening to it, and you know, listen to Vin, you, you always inspire me, and I had to, it took me down a path that I was almost, we're almost reflecting upon history while it's happening. People are going for everything, the vast majority of people are just going along. But, and what are they going along with? This idea that there is some mystery body that is helping you, that is protecting you from what? What are they protecting you from? So as you're going along with the, there's going to be a new vaccine that everybody's going to take and it's going to be mandatory and that's okay that it's mandatory because anybody that isn't taking it is a radical and an outlier and a misfit that needs to be either killed or brought into the herd, comply, comply, comply. Is that okay? For those who still have in them that light of humanity and you want to live a life as freely as possible. You want to embrace your humanity as deeply as possible. You are now a radical. You are now an outlier. You are now a rebel. You are now a freedom fighter. You've taken on no flag of no body, no political affiliation. You haven't wished to make waves in any way. You just want to come and go. Do your job and enjoy your family. You don't want to join a club, a union, an association, but now you have to. You wanted to take care of your own health with minimal intervention. You don't want to sign up for anything. Now suddenly, you're at war. What do you do? And you became this rebel, this outlier, this freedom fighter. Why? Why did you become that? Because you made a fatal mistake. You said the unspeakable word. You said why. You just said why.
Now you're outside the herd. What do you do? Well, I would say you do an assessment of resources, both material, emotional, spiritual, communal. And we start from scratch. Like civilization has always done. In the Mahabharata, they talk about the days after the Great War, when everybody was just scavenging for resources. And the burns of the blast of war had taken away everything, but we were damn near naked, so nobody could tell who was of high caste and who was of low caste, who was of good standing or low standing, who was saint or sinner. And you just kind of shared your knowledge of how to get by, how to get through the day. And you learn from that, from those meager things, how to find joy in the moment, how to accept that death may come with sunrise. So you live that day completely and that's a lesson to us all just right now. Just live completely in the moment. They did a show about sex around the world. And they found that the Lebanese had the most open and fulfilling sex lives. They said, why the Lebanese? They've been living under the threat of war for so long that not a single adult Lebanese person can speak without speaking of someone they're close to who, who has been killed in the war. And it's happened for so long, when they live, they live completely. They open up, they party, they love, they embrace, they bathe in intimacy. Because they know that this is it. They've been through it for so long. As I listen to you, Vin, and I think, and no one, none of us here can answer the question, what won't you go along with? Yeah. We just blew up the world. And for those of us who survived, all we have is what we have right now. We are naked. And we're going to get a meal, and we're going to find shelter, and we're going to love the people we're around, knowing that this is it, and whatever we get beyond this is a blessing and good fortune. That's the picture that, that you shared with me, and as, as I talked to Carlos and Caitlin, I don't know, or maybe somebody hearing this will chime in, or maybe we'll do another piece. But there's nothing people won't go along with to feel secure against the ghost. You will drug yourself, chip yourself, support all manner of totalitarian rule, authoritarianism, you're just going to go along with all that. And so all ideas of freedom, of the sanctity of life, of liberty, they die. Not because something happened, but because of the fear of what would happen. So you gave up the things that make life worth living so you could live. Well, I think that's another lesson in all this. If we talk about why this is happening and why it's happening now, maybe people don't have that much to give up. Yeah. If you're already living in a high state of anxiety, if you don't have good relationships, if you don't exercise and step outside of your house, guess what? You get to hang out, <laughs> collect some checks, watch TV. Not that bad. What... 
what makes us alive is what makes us human is that we we endure struggle and we innovate and we have ideas and where is art born from where is creativity born from from the adversity from the struggle to live what produces a great scientist or great athlete is a challenge adversity all that's stripped away now it's it's like a something spelled out in the Mahabharata at the end of the Mahabharata the omens of the Kali Yuga where half the people on earth would be like the walking dead just like a horror movie just like what you just pitched just the picture you just painted well it's, it's literally it's like that it's you're on the streets everyone's wearing a mask it's like they're walking around after a nuclear fallout it just looks surreal it, and, what the, again, I guess, man, I want to end this on a, a good note, if I can even find. Because I feel okay, honestly. I, I, I've always been in the, in the desert anyway, so I'm just concerned about Carlos and all these other kids coming up. What kind of world? Just because I have a lot of love for them and and I value all of you guys so much, and it's been it's such a different world that I live in, anyway. How do you find your, how do you, how do you find your life? I mean, I, I've had a wonderful life filled with stories and adventures. And I was on the phone the other day sharing with one of the students a story I had about you know, my travels and they will never have those stories. They will never have those adventures. But they will breathe, they will exist, and they will have Netflix. <laughs> I don't know. I need I need maybe Caitlin and Carlos to close the show today, Van. Can, I don't even think you can close the show because even though I'm old enough to be your dad, I, f I feel like you're closer to... This isn't even real for you. No, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. I mean, I almost feel like I've got a... A spoken word piece I put together on this, mm -hmm. which articulates all this. Maybe I'll do that as an addendum. But uh, I don't want to paint too dire of a picture. I don't know what's going to happen. No one can predict how this turns out. Maybe we do get back to normal. I'm not saying we don't. What is normal, though? Well, then maybe we go back to a point where restrictions on our liberty are eased, where the economy functions, where people have Does jobs. Does that ever happen? So back to the system? Yeah, back to where we Does were. Does that ever happen where once they take liberties away, they're given back? I don't know if that's ever... Has that well, ever I think I think it oscillates. I mean, you might have a long-term decline, but everything is cyclical. But people don't even know that you said that there's nothing people are willing to give up. You said it earlier. Weren't we already broken? I mean, fear is the prodding rod that moves us now. And so really it's a question for them, don't you think, Vin, for the, the people in their, their, their early 30s and 20s and teens, right? Yeah, I think this you question... you had a taste of freedom. You had a taste of it. You had a taste of being human. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. You got a little taste of it. So you're tainted. You're doomed. But what about them? What about them? I don't know. I don't know. But have they ever known that? I, I, what do you think, Caitlin, Carlos? Can you guys help us out? This is weird. Um, I'm not sure what um, our generation is going to do. But I think that we've already, and you can kind of see it, we've already learned that we have to be adaptable. You can see that we changed majors a lot in college. What's adaptable mean? Does that mean getting microchipped and being okay with No, that? I mean, I draw the line there. That's where I personally... What will you do, though? When, I'll when, drop when, out. Uh, I where, can... where, where will you go? What skill do you... What do you, what do you know? I mean, that's all I'm saying. I'm not yeah. challenging. I'm just no, saying... No, no, I understand. I mean, that's, I grew... That's he... this... When, when this guy... What was his name? Was it Bill Gates or whoever yeah. it was the other day said, by authoritarian rule, yeah. you, get these, you get drugged and you get regulated and managed observed and tracked Can I, without question. Yeah. I grew up 
in quarantine because I'm from a really rural part of Indiana. Okay. So for me, this is in this is actually I've been dredging up a lot of childhood memories okay. of being not able to go see my friends or do those things. Okay. I can very easily go back to that. And I do know how to grow food. I do know how to I used to bike ride ten miles a day to go places. I'm I'm not afraid of that. So but I, I grew up in that with mm-hmm. that already. So for me this is just like I'm enjoying it. Okay. Until it's until I gotta go. I feel the same way, like, but although I mean I see the concern that Master Z has with our generation. I mean most of if not a good majority of our generation will want those conveniences, that freedom to go back and forth from Nevada and here without any hassle. It's the hassle that they that we mm-hmm. need, the 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 inconvenience that we loathe. So yeah, majority would yeah. get the chip. Why not? It's whatever. I don't really care. I have nothing to hide. I'm just gonna go work, get my paycheck, go party on the weekend, and repeat the cycle again and again and again and again until I'm dead. As long as nothing interrupts this. Yeah. But me personally, I I'd opt out. I'd head to South America. I'll go to <coughs> Argentina. Grow food. Build my own place. Chill. I'm okay out there. As soon as all this is done. Because, you know, if, if, if you follow that trend, it is not sustainable. Just like we thought this great infrastructure this great machine could never stop. It came to an abrupt and screeching halt based on rumor of something bad happening. It stopped the whole machine. And like something out of a horror novel, a science fiction novel, most people will go along for convenience. and the machine can be stopped and you will stop with it. I don't know. Well, you always like to end on how. How do we (coughs) get beyond this? How do we fix this problem? Some of the things you said, I totally agree with. The appreciation, the gratitude, being present, living every moment. That's something that I've become much more aware of in the last few weeks, that we can't sit around waiting for things to get back to normal. Who knows? If that happens, what's on the other side? All we have is now, so let's enjoy that. I think we've talked about knowing how far you're willing to go, what you're willing to compromise. That speaks to character. Having that integrity is Mm -hmm. important. But Z, what practically do you do? I mean, what if you were in your house and the police, and maybe you're a bad example, but (laughs) but, but say even someone who you respect who's got some fire who's not broken, police come, threaten to drag you off to jail, lock you up for the rest of your life if you don't put this chip inside of you. Do you go along with that? Do you go to jail? You, you, Do you say goodbye to your family? Yeah, I'm the wrong person to ask because I, I accept death completely. I, I'm just free. I, I'm not, I, I don't want to be a part of that. I don't, you know, I just... You know how they threaten the Muslims that they're going to bathe them in pork and kill them and all this kind of stuff? And mm. They just say, go on and take me, man. If that's what you got to do. That's why torture didn't work on those guys, right? They talk about how they tortured them and did all kind of weird stuff to them to debase their religious views. And They just left the room. They just physically left their body and there was no information they could, no useful information they could extract. I don't know. I think the best thing that, that, that we could part with is go back to bhakti. That's what it says in the scripture. This is the time of devotion, quietude, quiescence, turning inward, looking to the left or right in front of you and see the people you love around you and just hold them and nurture them and love them and immerse yourself in that, that divine bliss. Create that or around you that inoculates you from this kind of madness. 
You know, when I hear Carlos speak and he knows that most people will just go along, it's not unlike people who went to war. They didn't ask questions, they just went and killed for their leader who wouldn't kill for them, who wouldn't risk their own life. Part of us have always done that, just mindlessly go along with things. I, I guess maybe because we have so many people on earth now that will do that. It's strange, right? It's just strange. But we're here, we're here now, we're alive, we're well. And as the scripture said, there are many of us who will be alive and breathe, and even though we have a pulse, we're really dead. We're in the evolution is leveled off, we're deable. And to advance and to evolve, we must go through struggle to get better, to be better. So maybe we're living in the time of the decline of human evolution. And for those of us who participate in the continuance of humanity, we are those who are willing to struggle and ache and feel joy and pain. But we will be surrounded by people that feel neither joy nor pain. And we're in a continuous flick, uh, loop of Netflix reruns. And as Carlos said, they will be content with that. There will be no inconveniences. There will be no disruption of the, of what? No disruption of comfort. Of their norm. Or of ease. Of ease. There will be no cold, it won't be too cold, it won't be too hot. It won't be too sweet, it won't be too sour. It won't be too bright and it won't be too dim. And for that, we will exist. We will not live, but we'll exist. But for the outliers that will, I believe, perpetuate human evolution, they will feel the extremes of uncertainty, of discomfort that will drive us to innovate and to strive for better. So maybe we're just at that point and I hope to be a part of the mitigating of human suffering through the forward evolution of our of our collective species. You guys made a crazy picture. Well, I'm going to end on one thing, which maybe is hopefully more practical than these societal problems we've talked about. We're not going to change the direction of this train. It's going to do what it's going to do. But if we get back to that question of why, I would say, let's ask two things. One is, why are we living in fear? What are we afraid of? Number two, is it worth it? What's the cost of that? And we can apply that to what's happening right now. But we can apply it. We can apply it every day. Yeah. That's great. I think that's a good way to close. Because I don't... I'm okay. I mean, life's okay. And I'm happy for the people. But I've lived a long life. It is Carlos and these kids that have a whole bunch of years ahead of them. That is the... In this time, I have... I, I don't see how it works. But again... I'm bound by my own reality, and I'm not saying that's everybody's reality, but um, again, it just goes back to devotion and gratitude. I'm glad that I've had a wonderful and full life, and I have a, surrounded by love. I have many adventures and stories, ups and downs, good and bad, and it's been a colorful life. Yeah. It's well, all yours, Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> Look, man, in these desperate times, it's good to hang out with your crazy ass. <laughs> hey, I'm glad to be here for you, and I look forward to many, many more years, and I'll share with you whatever I can. And may your stories be mine and, and my adventures if they help you uh, enjoy life more and give you more to live for. Um, yeah, these are interesting times, baby. I wish... 
You the best. <laughs> if you enjoyed the show, please consider leaving a review on Podbean, iTunes, or your favorite podcasting app. Every five-star review allows us to share more unique and insightful content. Learn more at thedispassionateobserver.com. Thanks for listening, and please tune in again next week. Peace.